morning. I have a communion meditation today. If you look at what we watch and what we read, our culture is obsessed with the end of the world. Some have a theory as to how it will happen. A zombie apocalypse, alien invasion, Jesus comes back. Others have a plan for exactly when and where they think it will all go down. In Mark 13, Jesus gave us a vivid description of the signs of the end of the world as we know it. He includes important details, warnings, and instructions for those who love and obey him. You might already have a bunker set up, but what does Jesus say we'll need to survive? Number one, peace. Jesus tells us not to be alarmed at the rise of natural disasters and evil in this world. And that comes from Mark 13, 7 and 8. In the midst of the chaos, we can walk in his peace. Number two, the Holy Spirit. When we don't know what to say or how to explain what's happening around us, we can trust the Holy Spirit to be our guide. Perseverance. Jesus tells us to constantly be on our guard as we share the gospel. People will hate us for what we believe, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And that comes from Mark 13:13. 13, 13. Number four, the Bible. Jesus warns us to be on our guard against false teachings and teachers. As we study and seek God in his word, we will be able to distinguish the truth from lies. And that comes from Mark 13, 31. Jesus warns us about the future, not to scare us or distract us, but so we will know how to live in the present. Desire to grow closer to Jesus day by day, and our actions and attitudes will be a sign to this world that Jesus is alive and that his return is near. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, what a privilege to be able to come before you, before your throne of grace, and partake in the precious sacraments of bread and juice of the vine, in remembrance of your atoning sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. Thank you for dying for us on the cross and paying the enormous price for our sins so that we may be forgiven of all our faults and receive your indwelling life. May we never forget the enormous price that was paid on our behalf. May we never forget that we have been bought with a price, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we live for him from this day on, knowing that your body was broken and your blood was spilled for each of us. Thank you, Lord, in your most precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, if you take your bread, and it represents the body of Christ. And then the juice represents his blood that was shed for us. I think I did that out of order, but we said the prayer anyway. Amen. <laughs> Good morning. I don't know about you, but I've let myself get discouraged and I really don't like it. I've allowed myself to focus more on the bad than the good over the last year. Do you ever feel like we live in a world now that we doubt we will see good again? So I'm here today to encourage. I want to share with you Ephesians 1, verse 18, where the Apostle Paul prays for the Ephesian Christians. 
He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. I think this verse from Ephesians 1.18 offers us some encouragement. I know it does for me, and at a time I surely can use it. I pray this to you, just as the Apostle Paul prayed this for the Ephesian Christians. And it's been said in biblical commentaries that a man's prayers for others are, very, are a very fair thermometer of his own religious condition. What he asks for them will largely indicate what he thinks best for himself. And how he asks it will show the firmness of his own faith and the passion of his own feeling. And in that great prayer, we have Paul's response to the good news that had reached him of the steadfastness in faith and abundance in love of those Ephesian Christians. In that expression of his love, he prays for and offers hope. What does the Apostle Paul mean by naming it the hope of his calling? He means this, that the great act of the divine mercy revealed to us in the gospel by which God summons and invites men to himself will naturally produce in those who have yielded to it a hope of immortal and perfect life. And so, notice how this hope which Paul refers to is in some sense the very capstone of the Christian life. Paul has heard concerning these people in Ephesus of their faith and love. And because he has heard of these, therefore he brings this prayer. These two, faith and love, where faith apprehends the manifestation of God in Christ Jesus, and the love which faith produces in the heart accepts the re revelation of the infinite love are crowned by and are imperfect without and naturally lead on to the brightness of this great hope. Faith gives hope its contents. The Christian hope is not spun out of your own imaginations, nor is it the mere objective in a future life of unfulfilled desires of this disappointing present. It is the recognition by the trusting spirit flashed upon it by the word of God. Faith draws back the curtain and hope gazes into what, op what that open curtain reveals. My hope is the answer of my heart. Your hope is the answer of your heart and to the revealed truth of God. Now I've given you a lot to think about, so let's try to digest this a little bit. Why is the activity of hope so important for the Christian life? Well, because it stimulates effort. It calms the sorrows. It takes the fascination out of temptations. It supplies a new aim for life, and it provides a new measure for the things of time and sense. So what are the eyes of your heart, and how may they be enlightened that you may know the hope? This hope needs enlighten enlightened eyes. And the Apostle Paul prays that God may give to these Ephesians the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And then he adds, as a result of that gift, the desire that the Ephesian believers may have the eyes of their hearts enlightened. That's a remarkable expression. It does not mean that the affections are the agents by which this knowledge reaches us, but heart is used here, as it often is in scripture, as a general expression for the whole inward life. And all that the Apostle Paul means is that by the gift of the divine spirit of wisdom, a person's inner nature may be so touched as to be capable of perceiving and grasping the hope of the calling. And notice also how it's presented or phrased in Ephesians 1 through 18, that you may know the hope. 
How can you know the hope? Well, how do you know any kind of feeling? By having it. And the only way of knowing the hope is to hope. How can you know hope if you don't hope? And this hope is only possible by the eyes of the understanding being enlightened. Think about this. No person can look at something beside them with one eye and at something half a mile off with the other eye. Now, I tried it and it doesn't work, so. You have to focus the eye according to the object and by gazing upon the near is thereby blind to what to that which is far off. So if we go crawling around in the dirt with our eyes focused down with no hope, then of course we cannot see the crown above. We need more than biblical revelation of the light in order to enlighten the inward nature. And there are many who know all about the immortality that is brought to light by Jesus Christ. Even Satan knows that just as well as the Christian whose soul is full of hope of it, and yet, and who yet, for all their knowledge, does not know the hope because they have not felt it. Satan's hope is that we fail. The Lord's hope is that we are enlightened and that we may know the hope to which he has called us. But we have to get further than to the acceptance of the facts of a risen and ascended Savior before there can be in our heart any vital hope of immortality of eternal life in heaven. And the inward eyes, the eyes of the heart, must be cleared and strengthened. Cross lights and distractions must be shut out so that we may direct the eyes of our hearts towards what is worthy of their sight. And we cannot do that without divine help. That spirit of wisdom which will fill our hearts if we ask for it, which will clear our eyesight, which will withdraw it from seeing vanity, as well as give it reality to see. But we must observe the conditions, since this clearness of hope comes not merely from the acceptance as a truth of the fact of Christ's resurrection and ascension, but comes through the gift of that divine spirit. So, then to have it, you must ask for it. That's what the Apostle Paul did in his prayer to the Ephesians Christians. Do you ask for it? Do you ever pray, and I don't mean in words, but in real desire that God would help you to keep steadily before you that great future that is fastly approaching you? If you do, you'll get the answer. Seek for that divine spirit. Use it and do not resist it. Do not fix your gaze on the world when God is trying to draw you to fix it upon himself. Think more about Christ Jesus. Think more about God's high calling. Live nearer to him. Try more honestly, more earnestly, more habitually, more prayerfully even amidst all the troubles and difficulties and trivial events of the day, to cultivate that great sense of joyful and assured hope. Now let's face it, we are all too short-sighted. Our fault is not that we do not hope, but that we hope for such near things, for such small things. We cannot set our hopes on the things that perish though. Our Christianity is imperfect unless faith and love find their outstretching completion in the Christian hope. Faith and love find their completion in hope. I know what it's like to love something so much it holds the power to break your heart. I'm sure most of you do too. For some of us, our pain's history comes from a different place. Grief from the death of someone we love, a, pain, a painful relationship betrayal, a weary ongoing internal battle, 
or whatever it may be. None of us are immune to life's hard things. And then there has been, as you well know, the global pandemic, which has brought with it a level of weariness, doubt, disillusionment, and despair that a lot of us have never known before. It has us longing to believe again, hope again, and see good in our lives and good in this world again. But can I suggest something that can help us through the different hard circumstances? If you are feeling powerless to change your circumstances and struggle to have a hopeful perspective, ask God to help you move from what if to what is, and from what was to what now. You see, we need to shift our focus. And these shifts in focus are not only agents of change in our heart and our mind, but they are also life-altering biblical ideas. What if is a place where we are often stuck in, a defeating, repeating pattern of questions without good answers that hinders our ability to move forward in life. But what is becomes a focal shift to the realities at hand, the possibilities that still exist, the hope we are afforded as believers, and the promise of heaven, the ultimate prize. What was is a place we often revert to and dwell in unnecessarily, rehashing painful things in our history, our past, living in regret and resentment. But what now becomes our powerful new perspective for each and every day, which brings a new level of positivity, hope, and peace. Whatever has happened to you wasn't necessarily fair. It wasn't right. It certainly wasn't what you wanted. But what, but what can God do with your life now? What now? Where can you find joy? What remains that can be used for eternal purposes? Let me ask you this. Do you, in fact, believe that God has the power to enlighten the eyes of your heart to give you hope again, as Paul prays in our key verse? And I want to repeat that verse. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. You see, this is key. In order that you may know the hope, the eyes of your heart must be enlightened. That enlightenment comes from the triune God. There needs to be a movement of the head and the heart for this to occur, a shift of focus, if you will. We will know when that occurs by experiencing it, feeling it, in what is the hope of his calling. It is possible. Is it possible that the one powerful enough to create you and love you through this hardship could also be powerful enough to help you see good again in its aftermath? Well, yes, of course, it, it can. I know you and I have been hurt at some point or more in our lives. And oh, how this world is imperfect and hurtful. Yet even with that being true, I hold tight to the promises that God still has good for us, to instill good in us, even in the hurt, even despite the hurt, even today, for you and for me. And there is hope in the good coming we will be enlightened to it. We will know the hope to which he has called us. In closing, let me share two familiar passages that lend comfort and hope to us. Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, 
through Christ Jesus, is calling us. In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 through 9, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. So how would your life change if you went from what if to what is, and from what was to what now? And what is one practical way you can move forward from a hard circumstance today, making progress from yesterday into today, and then see what tomorrow brings? The eyes of your heart will help you. You will know the hope to which he has called you. Shall we pray? Dear Jesus, give us eyes to see the good again. Lord, help us to see good in our lives and, and in other people. Most of all, help us see and know your goodness that we might long to serve you more and more. Lord, we seek to see and walk in the light of the hope of your calling. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.